17. You know, as uh, pastors, preachers, they say you should never come up before the people and say, I don't know what I'm supposed to say, but I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Um, and uh, I gave Eunice a few verses that I feel like the Lord placed upon my heart, but there's a passage here that I just couldn't get away from this morning, and, um, and I just feel that we're to read this passage here, and I'm hoping that whoever's watching, those of you who are here, that it would just minister to you. You know, I read something this week, someone posted something, somebody who's kind of a little antagonistic, and, um, and the person said, you know, it bothers him when, when ministers say, you know, the Lord was leading me, the Lord was leading me to speak this, the Lord is leading me to speak that. And I kind of get what he's saying. He's saying, because when you open the word of God, and this is true what he's saying, this part, but when you open the word of God, it's God's word. And so the Holy Spirit will speak to the hearts of anyone who hears it when you just open God's word. And that's true. However, we always want to get from God what is called a rhema word, which is a word in season, because I can get up here, right, Deidre, and I could talk about stewardship. But that may not be where people are. People may need to hear about faith, right? Maybe they're believing for a healing. So, yes, the word will minister on stewardship, but where, where are the people at? What does God want to say to the people? And that's always a struggle for a minister, especially a pastor who does, like, got these serious and things like that. What do I do? And I know the Lord is leading me away from Acts for a few weeks. We're going to talk about the Bible. But today, I'm really just like, in a, in a sense, like, okay, God, I'm just going to just obey what it is you put in my heart. Um, and I pray that it would minister to us. And I pray this is a rhema word for us today. So I want you to turn to Luke 17, chapter 20, uh, verse 20. We're going to read all the way into chapter 18. Now, I know chapter 18, I can get into chapter 18, 1 through 8, but the Lord says start with chapter 17. So that's what we're going to do. So if you have it, just say God, so I know you're there with me. Look at me for a second. Thank you, brothers. Appreciate you all. Um, how many in life, I guess this is kind of like where I've been with meeting, talk with people. How many in life you have felt like, not giving up on life, I'm not talking about suicide, but in life you have felt that there were times where you just felt like giving up. Let me see your hands. If, um, right? We felt like giving up. Like you know the goal. The goal is X, Y, and Z, but you can't get through D, E, F, right? Because the moment you get to B, you're already feeling a little tired, but then when you get to C, you're like, oh, my God. By the time you get to D, you're like, forget this. I'm just done. D for done, right? And it's like, so like if there's a goal to lose weight and, and yet you're not seeing the results as fast as you want to see them, what happens? Tend, it tends, people tend to just stop eating the right way or stop going to the gym or whatever the case may be. Or if you want to get a certain diploma, right? If you're see, seeking for a certain uh, diploma of some sort, it's like if, if it's not happening in the timeline in which you want it to happen, you can get really discouraged. You know this to be true already. And you just say, ah, oh, forget it, I'm done. It's like many people I've met who just don't have their high school diploma, so they want to go for their GED, but then when they go for their GED, they're older now, and they're in classes with a lot of younger people, and so that's kind of discouraging because they don't want to be around all these younger people, and then they realize it's going to take more time than they thought. They thought, hey, the three and a half years that I had in high school, I thought I could just put that together and get it in like one shot. Just let me take the test, but no, it takes some time. I mean, no, things take time. But in the time, in that timing of waiting for whatever it is that you believe in for to happen, you get discouraged. And you just want out. You just want to just turn back. And so I think that's really the, what the Lord has laid in my heart here for us today, that for us not to turn back. And let's, so let's look in Luke chapter 17, verse 20, and let's, let's see how this is going to make some sense to us. It says this, once having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God will come, Jesus replied, look at me now, the kingdom of God. And I'm going to do this a little bit for this passage here. The kingdom of God, also interchangeable with the, the kingdom of heaven, which means God's rule, God's reign, right? So when is God going to now come and just take over and just going to be God ruling and reigning? But I mean, no, God is already ruling and God is already reigning, right? But they're believing and waiting for the Messiah's reign. Um, so that's what they're saying here. And the coming, Jesus said, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is or there it is. And here's what he says, because the kingdom of God is in your midst, or he's already here. Some translations have within you, but that's not correct. It would be more so he's here, right? He's in your midst. But why? Because he's ushering in the kingdom of God. He's the king. It goes on to say, verse 22, then he said to his disciples, the time is coming. Now listen to this, everybody. The time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. People will tell you, there he is, or here he is. 
do not go running off after them. For the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning, which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. In other words, you're going to all see it. He says, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation, which we already know took place. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then, everybody say then. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It would be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the housetop with possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. And then he says this, verse 22, remember Lot's wife. Look at me for a second. You all remember about Lot, don't you? And you write, read this in Genesis and how Lot, uh, his wife, it doesn't even have a name. It's just Lot's wife. And they were told to leave, to go to a certain place. And whatever you do, the, the word was don't look back. That was the word to her, to the family. Don't look back. But somehow Lot's wife, in the midst of almost making it, I think it's to Zor, I think it's the place, almost making it there, she decides to turn back. And when she turned back, she became what one commentator says, and I've been quoting this for years, he says she became a useless monument of salt. The salt is useful, but she was useless. Why is that? Because she decided to look back. She decided to look back at what she once had, where she once lived. You got to remember, a lot, they were like nomads. They were always traveling. They never had a steady place until they got to Sodom, which they shouldn't have been there in the first place. So now, can you imagine, this is a place where she built her home, put up the nice drapes and things like that, and now she was leaving it all because the Lord says, you got to get out of here. I'm going to destroy it. And right when they were right on the edge of getting to the place that God had for them, she turned back. And the moment she turned back, immediately she became a useless monument of salt. So she never was able to obtain, uh, to get to where it is that God wanted them to be because she what? Look back. So he says, remember Lot's wife. Look at verse 33. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Where, Lord, they replied, they asked. He replied, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather don't know quite what that means. I'll look that up and find out for you. Verse, chapter 18, verse 1. Then, everybody say then. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. So what's the purpose for this parable? To show us that we're to what? Always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones? Underline that. Say that nice and loud. Say chosen ones. Right. Who cry out to him day and night. Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to a temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and even give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at, the di at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted Keep going, verse 15. People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. And when the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Look at me. Let's see where we're going to go with this here. 
So here now, Jesus is talking to these Pharisees. These Pharisees come and say, when is the kingdom of God coming about? Jesus says, it's already in your midst, talking about himself, right? And then he goes on to this dialogue with them, or not really a dialogue. He begins to just share with them about, hey, don't get caught up with looking for things. Because we live in a generation now where everybody's looking for signs and wonders. And I'm not saying it's not appropriate to be excited about signs and wonders, but he doesn't tell us to look for signs and wonders. Remember, when we started in the book of Acts, what did he say? Don't worry about when I'm going to come back and reign. You just go and be what? My witnesses. Just do what it is I'm calling you to do. That's it. Just live life. Because don't worry. When I come back, when it takes place, you won't miss it. As lightning flashes to and fro, guess what? You're going to see it. As a matter of fact, listen, it's going to be a time when two people were standing right beside one another. One's going to be taken and the other's going to be left. As it was in the days of Noah, people were drinking, partying, having a good time. But how many know in Noah, the scripture says in 1 Peter, Noah was a man, preacher of righteousness. He went around telling people to come on, get right, get right. But nobody wanted to get right. So as a result of not getting right, they got left. Get it? Got left behind, right? And there came a day when they laughed and they laughed at Noah for all those years of him building that, that ark. But how many know there came a day when the ark door, the door closed? And who closed it? The Lord closed it. Because obviously it was too big for them to close it themselves. But that door closed. And so he says, as it was in the days of Noah. And then the floods came and it destroyed. Okay? He says, as it was with Sodom, with Lot. Remember, hey, listen, the Lord came and he rained down sulfur and, and all these different things of fire down on them. It came about. What the Lord said, it came about. But whatever you do, and this is what he's getting at all this, whatever you do, don't look back. If you got things downstairs, leave them downstairs because you don't need them anyway. Just be ready. That's all he's saying. Just be ready. Don't look back. Don't shrink back. Don't go back because there's nothing to go back for. Now, the problem that we have, though, and I think you would agree with me on this, maybe not you, but you talked to enough people, is that as we're waiting for the Lord to come back, many of us want to look back. Because while we're waiting for the Lord to come back, there is some suffering that's going on. There's some pain that's involved. And so the enemy, who is the accuser of the brethren, not just the accuser of the brethren, but the enemy who attacks our mind, is making many people feel like, again, God doesn't love you. Is there really a God? Because if there was a God, what, why is it what's happening in Ukraine happening? Why are women being raped? Why are children being, uh, uh, you know, hunted down and killed? Why, why are all these things happening? Okay, if there really is a God, because look, you, don't, you love God, right? Why is all this happening to you when you serve the Lord? You live for God, but all these things are happening for you. And now what happens is the enemy comes and makes us want to go back, wants us to give up. But Jesus said, wait, 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 before you give up, because as you're thinking about all the stuff I said, I want you to know this. I want to give you a story. A parable is a story that illustrates the truth. So it's not a true story. But there's a truth in this story. And why is he giving this story? So that we would pray and what? Not give up. So if you're here today and you're ready to give up because you're like, listen, I'm waiting on the Lord, but I'm not seeing anything about the Lord. Jesus says, hey, please pay attention to this story right here. Because I want you to pray and not give up. See, the key is all of this and all of this is to pray. The reason why people give up is because they don't pray. I think I read one time ago that one writer said this, when there's no praying, there's fainting. <laughs> but you won't faint if you pray. Because Jesus said it clearly. This is given so that you would pray and not give up. So he gives this story. And really it's a contrast. He talks about this unjust judge, this judge who doesn't fear God, doesn't care about people. And yet this widow, right, and when she's a widow, it means that she doesn't have a husband. And not only does she not have a husband because her husband died, but most likely she doesn't have a brother. She doesn't have any sons. So she's left to herself, and there's somebody who's coming against us. Maybe it's a financial situation. Again, it's a story to illustrate the truth. Truth is not a true story. But there's some type of financial situation. Either way, the only one that can help her is this judge. But the problem is this judge is unjust. The problem is this judge doesn't care about God, so if he doesn't care about God, he doesn't even care about people. But yet, he's the only one that she can go to in order to get justice from her adversary. Because there's someone coming against her, whether the person's taking her to court or whether the person's not giving her what she's due. We don't know the circumstances. We just know the only one who can help her is this judge. But again, he's unjust. Doesn't love God, doesn't love people. But Jesus says, I'm giving you this parable so that you will what? Pray and not give up. So what does the lady do, Jesus said? Jesus says the lady does this. She keeps bothering him. I like that. 
She keeps bothering him. She's a pest. She's a nag. And what it means there is this. Everywhere he went, she went. So when that man, because he would just ignore her. She went to him. He probably threw out the courtroom. But she understood. I'm not leaving you alone, Jack. You're the only one who can help me. Because if I didn't need you, I would go someplace else. But because I need you, I'm not going to be too proud to come to you. And I'll keep asking and I'll keep pleading, but I'm going to go beyond pleading. I'm going to tell you, grant me justice, which means this. I have a right to ask this of you. Can't be given justice if there's no right. I have a right to something. And you're not giving me what I have a right to. So everywhere he would go, she would go. Can you imagine? He's sitting down having dinner with his family. She's knocking on the outside the door. She's just screaming. You've seen those movies where the jealous girlfriend or the jealous boyfriend's outside screaming, hey! Can you imagine? She's just saying, grant me justice against my adversary. He's sitting there trying to eat his fried chicken and collard greens and cornbread or panil or whatever else he's eating. And she's just out there. All he is, and the neighbors are like, what's going on? We got this person. Oh, don't just ignore her. But you know what? You can try to ignore her, but she's not going to let herself be ignored. She's crying all the more. Grant me justice against my adversary. He goes to the store. He's with his family. He's in the store. Grant me justice against my adversary. He goes off to work, grant me justice against my adversary. Can you imagine? This is day in and day out, all day long, every hour, every minute. Grant me justice against my adversary. Why? Because he's the only one who can grant her what it is that she has need of. So she refuses to leave the only one who can give her what she needs alone. I'm going to say it again. She refuses to leave the only one who can give her what she, le- what she needs alone. She refuses to do that. I'm sure people are saying, hey, girl, you're too loud. Come on. You're too grown for all that. Stop that. Send an email. Send a text. You know, get, get a lawyer. Protest. Pick it. Do something. But stop this. She's like, nah. He needs to know. I need justice. Reminds me of a man named Blind Bartimaeus. Remember him? Who was down the roadside as Jesus was passing through Jericho. And Blind Bartimaeus heard that Jesus was passing by. And as he heard that Jesus was passing by, he screamed out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Right? Why is that? Because he understood Jesus, the son of David, the Messiah, was passing by. And if there's anything we know about the Messiah, at least he knew growing up, was that the Messiah has power in his hands. And obviously he heard about Jesus. You heard me say this plenty of times. He heard about Jesus. So it's not enough to just hear about Jesus. If he's passing by, what am I going to do? I'm going to get Jesus' attention. And so scripture says that the disciples rebuked him, say, hey, quiet down, stop. What is all that noise? You don't need to do all that. But he cried out louder. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the scripture says that with all the noise and all the crowd, Jesus stopped and called the man towards him. There's something about when you understand that he's the only one who can do what needs to get done. So I'm not going to leave him alone. There's something about that, right? That's why I would blind Bartimaeus. But now it's back to this parable Jesus gives. And the scripture says that this man said, yo, Ja, is that how you say this man? Ja, enough. I've just had enough of this. What does she want? Just, just, just give her what she wants. Imagine. He says, before she wears me out, or some translation, before she gives me a black eye. And so many debate on this. It means this. Like, you know, before she gives me a black eye in, my, in terms of my name, and people say, you know, I'm just unjust. But he didn't care about people, so I don't believe that was the case. Right? It had more to do with, like, yo, she's getting violent. <laughs> she's getting violent. So before she lay hands on me, <laughs> let me just give this woman what she wants. Because it ain't going to be pretty. Right? So it got to a point where he understood she's getting to a point where she's about to lay hands on me. So before she gives me a black eye, let me give her what she wants. And the Lord said, look at this unjust judge who doesn't fear God and he doesn't fear man. Yet he granted to her what it is that she was asking for. Then he says this. I want to make sure we read this here. The way it says it here, he says, and listen to what he says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones? In other words, he's not saying God, because sometimes people misunderstand and think that God is the unjust judge. God is not an unjust judge. God is a just judge. God is a judge, yes, but he's a just judge. He's not an unjust judge, right? And God obviously cares about man because God sent his son to die for man. So it's not not that they're not making a comparison. What he's trying to do is show the contrast. That if this unjust unrighteous, unloving, uncaring judge would do for this woman what she has need of. How much more? Will not your father, would not your God, will he not give to you what it is that you're believing for? For his chosen ones to cry out to him, what? Day and night. 
So because you belong to him, he says, listen, this is going to help you not to give up. What's going to help you not to give up? To just keep coming to him. And he says, will he not grant them justice and grant it to them quickly? And see, the problem that we have here is that word quickly. Because quickly means our timetable. But guess what? Quickly is not our timetable. Quickly is his timetable. So, and it becomes quick when we learn to yield and submit and yield to, yield to him as we sit in his presence. Then it becomes quick to us because you know what? In the meantime, while, he, while he's getting to what it is he's going to do, he's ministering to us. He's comforting us. He's giving us what we need so that when it happens, it happens when it needs to happen. Somebody please say amen. amen. And what he's showing us is this. Keep coming to God. It's not insulting to God to keep coming to God. That's what he's getting at here as well. And you're not bothering God. Unlike this judge who was bothered, you don't bother God. What you're showing is dependency upon God. What you're showing is trust in God. What you're showing is, God, if you don't do it, it won't get done. So, God, I'm going to keep coming to you. And let me tell you something. It gets hard to keep going on because it hurts to keep going on. It hurts. As you're waiting for it to happen, for the relationship to be reconciled, as you're waiting for the funds to be cleared, as you're waiting for the promotion to come, as you're waiting for the doctor to give the report, as you're waiting for the healing to take place, there is some hurt that takes place. It's just like when you think about Jesus. Listen, that's what I want to say. It's not, it's not wrong to feel like, you know, and I've heard some people say, and I've, and I've said it. You know, people, I've said it. Just once you give it to God, that's it, just leave it there. And there are things that the Spirit of God makes real to you that, hey, you said it, I've heard you, now praise me. There are things. But then also there are things you got to keep coming to God for. This is why he says keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, right? And that's present tense, just keep it going. So I know I've said it in the past where, hey, you just pray it, that's it, leave it alone. But no, some things you got to keep coming to God for because it hurts so bad. The Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 12, what happened? 1 Corinthians 12, what happened there, right? He says, but he went to the Lord because there's thorn in his flesh, but the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. But the scripture says that he pleaded with him three times. It doesn't mean he only went three times. It just says three times he heard the Lord say, I'm sorry. He heard the Lord say, my grace is sufficient for you, which means he could have been praying more than three times. But how about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? This is the son of the living God. Fully God, yet fully man. And in the garden, he knew the assignment. The assignment was, I've come to die. He told his disciples, listen, i got to go to Jerusalem and die. But it didn't take away from the pain. And in his humanity, what did he do? I'm sure there was a moment, in a sense, that he felt like giving up, in a sense, because he went and said, God, if this can pass, then let it be so. As I think about the pain involved, the separation involved, I really just don't want to do this. But as he spent time in prayer, kept coming to the Father, kept coming to the Father, kept coming to the Father, what, do you, what was he able to say? Not my will, but your will be done. Are you all following what I'm saying to At least what I feel God is speaking to my heart to say? So not my will, but your will be done. And when is that taking place? As he keeps going to the Father, keeps going to the Father, keeps going to the Father. And what is it doing? It's helping him not to give up. It's helping him not to give in. It's helping him to complete the assignment. As Paul went to the Father, as he went to the Lord Jesus Christ over and over again, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. And that's why he would boast. Therefore, I'll boast all the more about my weaknesses. And I'll delight in insults and persecutions. Why? Because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. What was happening? As he kept going, he kept getting strength and strength and strength and strength. Because the goal is we know we're going to get to heaven. The goal is we know the Lord's going to come. Whether we die in this life or whether he comes and receives us, we know the goal is that we're going to be with him for all eternity. But man alive, whew, while we're on our way there, there are things that just makes me at times want to just turn around. Turn around. Come back, Tyrone. Okay. I don't think that was the Spirit of God that was. <laughs> but yeah, there are things that just makes you just want to turn around. Make you want to just stop. Make you say, what am I doing this for? What, why am I doing this? Asaph said that in Psalm 73. He said, I'm doing all the right things. He said, my, feet, my foot almost slipped when I looked at it, how the unrighteous were just making it and doing everything. And then here I am. And he was, and I like the New Living Translation. And all these fat cats are just living large. Yeah, you make you want to turn around. But the Lord says, this is, listen, please, I'm giving you this story so that you will pray and not give don't be like, like Lot's wife. Don't look back. Don't be like those on the roof saying, I got to go down and get. No, no, no. When you go down and get, you may miss out on what it is I have for you. 
Now, the whole context here is about the kingdom of God, about the coming of the Lord. That's the context here. But the principle is the same. It's about whatever it is that God's promised you. When you go back, you may miss out. I, I saw a meme some years ago, and it's, it's, it's so powerful. To me, it's very powerful. It's a meme of a guy with like a, what do you call that, a pick, um, uh, like a chisel pick, whatever it is, right? And he's, he's digging, whatever the, the, the miners use, and he's picking, he's picking, picking, right? And so he's looking for diamonds, right? And as he's looking for diamonds, you know, he's, uh, he's like this far away. He's like maybe like half an inch away if he just keeps going, but he stops and walks away, right? But he was this close. But I mean, no, don't, don't be mad at the guy. Don't go, oh, my God, you idiot. No, he's not an idiot. He's tired. He started all the way down there. <laughs> so when you see the picture of him right there, you're like, I can't believe. Yeah, I can believe. Because some of us are less than an inch away from whatever it is that God has for us. But we're tired. I'm tired of the conversations. I'm tired of them saying next year. I'm tired of them saying, well, we, we can only pick three, and you would have been the fourth one, so you got to wait. I'm tired. I mean, follow what I'm saying to you, right? Amen. I'm tired of hearing, you know what, the Lord knows what he's doing. <laughs> I'm not being sacrilegious. I'm telling you, I'm tired of hearing that, right? I know it's true. Come on, let me back up and tell you know what I, I know it's true. I said, I'm tired of hearing it in the moment. But the Lord is saying, uh-uh. Pray so that you don't give up. Because in that time of prayer, I'm going to give you what you need to help you to keep on keeping on. Then he goes on to this next thing, because it's all connected. When you read, you find it's all connected. And he talks about now this tax collector and this Pharisee. Because now this may be for somebody here. Oh, I'm sorry. This is for all of us here. Okay? The Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee gets up, right? Again, he started talking about the kingdom of God. He started talking about that. Then he went into this parable. Hey, pray so you don't lose heart. Then he starts talking about this Pharisee. He gave them another parable because he said, look, for those who were self-righteous, who were confident in their righteousness, he gave them another story to illustrate the truth. That there are people who feel like, you know what, hey, like this Pharisee, hey, I give, a, I tithe, I go to church, I'm not the Easter Palm Sunday crowd. Look, Tyrone, I'm still here. I serve in ministry. I help people, and I don't take a picture and show people that I help people. I do, I do. I read my Bible every day and twice on Sunday. I do all these different things. I'm not an evildoer. I, guess what? The guy said, I'm not an evildoer. I'm not a robber. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not this. But you didn't say you weren't proud because, my man, dude, you got a lot of pride there, right? But then... It says about the, the tax collector. Now, the Pharisee is the guy who reads the word of God, understands, quote unquote, understands the word of God, even though he searched the scriptures. Jesus said, you search the scriptures and you look, but you don't see that I am in the scriptures. You search the scriptures, but the scriptures speak about me, Jesus said, right? So they were missing it. But there are people who study the word of God, look at the word of God intently, understand and all these different things, ex, uh, expound on the word of God. That's what the Pharisee is. So this is someone who helps lead people to a closer relationship with God, walk with God. But then the tax collector is the guy who's hated by everybody. The tax collector is the guy who works with, with the Romans, works under the Roman rule, and he's there to collect taxes for the Romans. But what he does is he jacks up the prices so that if it's 15%, he'll charge 30% because 15% will go to him, and then the 15% will go to the Romans. So he was despised. That's why Jesus, that's why they said that he ate with sinners and tax collectors. Tax collectors had their own bracket, right? So there are people who have their own bracket when it comes to their income. Tax collectors had their own bracket. And so they were hated by the people. I mean, despised by the people. But yet, the man, Jesus says, but in this story, one left justified. Remember, justified. And the best way to remember that is just as if it never happened, right? Justified. And the other one didn't. Now, you would think the tax collector is the one who's not justified because of all the evil he's done. No, Jesus said this, the guy who started boasting about his, uh, that he's not evil, he's not a robber, he's not an adulterer, all these different things, that's the guy who left unjustified. But the man who simply beat his breast and said, I am a sinner, Lord, have mercy on me, that's the person who left justified. Why? Because that person came with humility, 
understanding that I can't earn this righteousness. I can't earn good favor with you. I can't earn for you to make something happen right away. All I can do is rest on your grace, rest on your mercy. All I can do is rest in your timing. So I come before you and I say, just be merciful to me. Look at me in my unhappy state and give me what I need. That's what he says. And that's the person who got what he needed in that moment. Not the proud person, not the person who was too proud to beg, but the person who came with this attitude that I don't need anything from you. you I deserve this from you because of what I've done. So it's not that I need, it's what I've achieved. It's not, it's not, what, it's not what, what I need, it's what I've earned. So, hey, God, look, come on now, do for me. And Jesus says, no, 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 only one left justified. You know what that means? Only one left right in the sight of God. You mean, but wait, 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 Tyrell, he tithed, and? He didn't rob anybody, and? He didn't commit adultery, and? He wasn't an evildoer, and? Because God said, uh-uh, all of that doesn't mean anything to me. He would go and say it another place, because all your righteousness are like filthy rags before me. But the guy who doesn't talk about tithing, the guy who doesn't talk about he served in the ministry, the guy who doesn't talk about doing anything except saying, Lord, have mercy on me. That's the person who left justified by the Lord. And if you're justified, right, that makes you now one of God's children. I'm starting, I'm painting a picture here. Makes you one of God's children. Because all of us are God's creation, but not all of us are God's children. Because in order to be someone, to be the child, right, and we could be grafted into the vine and all that, we know that to be true, but you got to resemble your parent. <laughs> you should resemble them somehow, right. right? So now everybody does that. So now here he is now, and musicians, if you come, and now it says this, that because he's justified, he's chosen. And now Jesus goes into, not a parable, he goes into a truth without a story. Because now they're bringing children to Jesus. They're carrying Jesus, they're carrying children to Jesus, and Jesus says this to them. And they're like, no, 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 keep, put, keep the children back, keep the children back. And he's like, no, 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 stop. Uh-uh, bring the children to me. This is why I don't care what anyone's lifestyle is like. I don't care how they live for the Lord, if they don't live for the Lord. If anybody wants us to dedicate their children, I'm going to always dedicate a child. And I'm going to pray, God, you protect that child from because the, the environment which they're living in, the devil would like to use that to make them other. But, God, you have a plan for that child's life. So when people say, how could you do that? Simply, Jesus said, let the children come. Not everybody was following him. Let the children come. Let's pray a blessing over them and protect them. God, raise them up to be different than the environment in which they're being brought up in. Somebody please say amen to that, right? Amen. So with that being said, so now they said, no, no, keep the children out. And Jesus, you know, they're rebuking them. And Jesus said, no, let the children come. And here's what he says, and this is how I feel like as I'm talking this out, the Lord is making it real to me, I believe. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Unless you be like one of these children, you can't receive the kingdom of God. You can't enter. And what is he saying? Is he saying unless, you, like, unless you're a child? No, unless you're childlike. Not childish, because remember Paul said, when I was a man, when I was a boy, I talked like a boy, I, I did like, when I was a child, I acted like a child, this, this thing, like but when I became older, I put childish things away. So child, being childish versus childlike are different things, right? You could be childish and be silly and, and, you know, ridiculous and all those different things, but childlike is simply this, trusting. Some say humble. No, I have not yet to meet a child that's humble, <laughs> okay? <laughs> trusting, yes. Depending, Yes. You know, uh, naive to a certain degree, yes. You know, believing what's being said, absolutely. He says, unless you be like this child, believing, trusting, depending. Oh, how about this? Being carried, you will enter into the kingdom of God. So now, when I think about this, I started off by asking how many of us felt like giving up? How many of us felt like giving up in life? And the reason why we felt like giving up is because, you know what? It's been hard. And we're tired and we feel like God where are you what are you doing what's taking so long come on I just you know like one person said to me this week you know I just want to go home and I thought they were talking about the country that they live in they're like no no I just, I just want to be with Jesus 
And I get it. I get it. Listen, we, we, we want to be with the Lord. But how many know But there's still work for us to do here, right? That's why he left us here, right? But I understood the pain of the person. I just want to go home. I'm just tired of this. I'm tired of the hustle and the bustle. I'm tired of all the pain. I'm tired of going home. And I'm tired of going home here on earth, which is why I want to go home to heaven a lot of times. And the Lord is saying, listen, please, whatever you do, remember what I told you about Sodom. Remember I told you about Lot's wife. Don't look back. Remember I told you, don't go back for anything. The point I'm trying to make here is it's going to happen. Just don't go back. And the point of the parable with the unjust judge, remember, I'm not unjust. I'm a loving heavenly father who's there for you, and you can keep coming to me because you're not a bother to me. I'm going to give you what you need when you need it. Just keep trusting me. Just keep coming back to me because if you keep coming back to me, I'm going to give you what you need to endure until the next time you feel weak, and I'll strengthen you again until I see fit to give you what it is you need. But just because you bought, just because you come to me doesn't mean I'm going to give it to you. Children come all the time. Come on, can I get it now? Can I get it now? I want syrup. 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 You can't have syrup all day. So it doesn't matter how many times you keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. If it's not my will, you can't have it. But if you keep spending time in my presence, I will make known to you what my will is. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. But it won't be your heart. It'll be him changing your heart to what his heart is. So therefore, you won't be keep coming with the nonsense. Because the scripture says this. When we do ask... We have not because we ask that, but when we do ask, we ask for the wrong motives. Right? Is that what it says? All right? I have to interject that right there. So now when we get along with him, he changes our motives. And so as we keep coming to him, he gives us what we need so that we don't give up and faint. But he says, but listen, make sure you keep coming to me and don't think you don't have to keep coming to me because you're righteous. Don't think you're justified because of what you've done. Remember, you're justified because of what I've done. That's what we just finished celebrating a week ago, right? So when you come before me, you keep coming like that, like that, that tax collector. You keep coming before me humbly. You keep coming before me humble. You keep coming before me dependent. You keep coming before me asking for mercy. And I will be merciful to you. But just know, because I'm merciful to you, you are justified. Because you're justified. Why? What am I saying? And you're like a child depending on me for the whole ride. And because you're justified, because you're like a child, let, let me tell you what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to give you what it is that you have need of. This is why it says, if we put that verse up, please, the first verse I have, because I think gave you three verses, right? Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say? This is what we kind of were studying in our life group. What then shall we say to all these things? This is the Amplified. If God is for us, who can be successful against us? He who did not spare even, everybody say even, even his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, everybody say also, along with him graciously give us all things. And that's what I want to focus on. He wants to give us all things. What? All things that we have need of. Who will bring any charge against God's elect? His chosen ones. Remember that? He will grant to his chosen ones who come before him night and day. Who will bring any charge against God's elect? His chosen ones. It is God who justifies. Remember, just like that, that, that man in the, in the parable, the tax collector, God justified him. Why? Because he was humble, because he committed and submitted himself to the Lord. It is God who justifies. That is declaring us blameless and putting us in a right relationship with himself. Who is the one who condemns us? Who? Christ Jesus is the one who died to pay our penalty. This is why we're no longer condemned, because Christ paid the price for us. And more than that, who was raised from the dead. Somebody say hallelujah. And who is at the right hand of God. What is he doing? Interceding with the Father for us. Constantly going before the Father on our behalf, because he knows what we have need of. And so going to the Father on our behalf, interceding, pleading on the Father, to the Father on our behalf to give us what we need in the moment in which we need it. Why? What is he giving us? He's giving us strength to endure. Giving us what we need to persevere. The parable of the unjust judge is all about perseverance, about per, per, being persistent. But you can't be persistent and I can't be persistent without the person of the Holy Spirit. We need him. Which is why the scripture says, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give, good, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask, he says in Luke 11. Look what it says in Hebrews 10. I want to say this to you. So do not throw away your confidence. Why? Everybody read that nice and loud in yellow. Ready? It will be richly rewarded. And I want to hear everybody. Ready? Right, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, not my will, but your will be done. 
going to the Father constantly praying so that I don't give up. Not my will, but your will be done. Not my will to leave, but your will be done to stay. Not my will to, to, to come and attack, but your will to affirm. Not my will, but your will be done. If we have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. After what? After you've done the will of God. So, today's thought, which went way longer than I thought, goes to Luke 7, Luke uh, 17, 18, verse 7. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? So today, I don't know what you've come in here with. I was telling the church on Tuesday, I had a friend of mine who said to me, you know, Ty, not everybody's broken. And that's true. But I believe we got some broken people in here today. I believe we got some broken people watching right now. You're, on your, you're right on the very edge of giving up. And the Lord is reminding you today, I'm going to bring the past. I told you, I could deal with Sodom, I could deal in the days of Noah. I keep my word. The kingdom of God is here, it's coming. The kingdom of God has already been ushered in, if you will. And there will be a day I'm going to come back and return for you. Yes, that's going to take place. But until then, you got to live life. But while you live a life, don't give up. Don't go back. Press ahead. And remember, you can press ahead. Why? Because you're my chosen one. And because you're my chosen one, you can keep coming to me. You are the elect of the Lord. That's right. He chose you. You should be, you should be rejoicing about that right now. That he chose you. You didn't choose him. He chose you. He chose to reveal himself to you. When someone says, I chose that house, you didn't choose that house. That house was revealed to you. And so the Lord revealed himself to you, and he chose to reveal himself to you. He chose to take the blinders off your eyes so you can see how beautiful, how majestic he is, and how loving he is, and how gracious he is, and what a life you can have with him. He chose to reveal that to you. And so because you're his chosen ones, his elect ones, listen, you come to him night and day, will he keep putting you off? No, but you got to keep coming to him night and day. He makes a way. Bow your heads and close your eyes if you don't mind. Oh, I know the Lord had us in the, that whole chapter there and a lot of things were said, but I pray that today somehow that ministered to you, whether you're watching or here in the sanctuary. I'm not going to call you up or call you forward, but I do want to pray for you. If you would say, Tyrone, I needed to hear that today. I needed to hear that today. I was on the edge, verge of just, I'm always constantly, the devil's trying to get me to come back and shrink back, but I'm not gonna throw away my confidence. He chose me, I belong to him, I'm gonna fulfill his word in my life. I just need to be like a child, totally dependent upon him. If you say that's you, just raise your hand. You can put it up and put it down. Just so I can see. I see your hands. I see your hands. You may put them down. Once you raise them, this really is just knowledge. Let the Lord see it. And I'm so grateful for all the hands that really encourages me to know that this was the Lord. Father, I lift up every hand. Matter of fact, just keep your hands up. Father, I lift up every hand that is raised in this place and those that may be raised at home. Your word is truth, Lord. We can always open your word. It's truth. We know the Holy Spirit will always minister through your word. But God, is something about that rhema word, that word that's in season. God, you know I desire just to hear from you so I can minister life to your people. But it's you, the Holy Spirit, who brings life to that word. And so, God, I pray that as they heard this word today, that, God, they will not give up, but they will press forward, God. Just like that woman who kept going to that unjust judge, you said, take note of her. She kept coming, but she was a bother to him. But we're not a bother to you. No, Lord, you welcome us coming to you night and day. For you said, how much more will you not, will you not do for us, for your chosen ones who come before you, who cry out to you day and night? That's what you said. So you want us to cry out to you day and night. And you're going to fulfill what needs to be fulfilled in us. You're going to strengthen us where we need to be strengthened, comfort us where we need to be comforted to help us to make it to the other side. We're not going to be like that picture of the man who was this close to the diamonds but be turned back because he got tired. No, Lord, we do get tired. Yes, your word says, though outwardly we waste away, yet inwardly we're renewed day by day. Give us what we need today, God, I pray. For every person here, Lord, you know what they're dealing with, whether, whether it be relationship, finances, God, their health. Lord, whatever it may be, Lord, uh, just personal achievements, personal goals, God, in the name of Jesus, 
Give them what they need today to make it until another day, God. Strengthen them, Father, I pray. Help them to know, Lord, what's waiting them is far greater than even what they've been going through, Lord. You're just using the weight of the circumstances to make them stronger, to be able to do what it is you call them to do, to have what it is that you want them to have. Because, Lord, if you give it to them prematurely, Lord, it may be too much of a weight for them to carry, God. They may not be as prepared for it as you want them to be. So, God, continue to work out your plan, your way. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And can we all say Amen, amen, and amen, and amen, amen. God is good. I want, to, I want to encourage you. I know it's difficult because of children and work and things like that, but I want to encourage you, Tuesday night, at least one Tuesday a month, try to come out, be here with us for our prayer meeting. How many know God answers prayer, right? And as I heard the people say for years, it's not that God changes the circumstance, it's that God changes you in the midst of the circumstance. Amen. God bless you. Have a great have a great day.